Thank you, Xu Ping, and thank, thanks for the invitation and the kind words for introducing me. So, uh, like Xu Ping said, uh, I had some interest in remote sensing, and then I moved on. Um, and, and at that time, I was also doing uh, 3D shape analysis and uh, 3D biometrics. And then I moved away for some time from uh, uh, remote sensing, and then came back to it because of LiDAR scanners, you know, when they're becoming more famous and uh, widely available. And then all these self-driving cars, they have like five LIDARs installed on, uh, on, on, on their self-driving vehicles. So I thought, you know, I mean, this is a good uh, way to go. So I've, uh, I'm going to speak about uh, mainly point cloud analysis and I'll divide my talk into three uh, parts. You know, first I'll talk about semantic segmentation, uh, some works that we did. And then I'll move on to object detection and tracking, uh, of course, also in point clouds. <clears throat> and then finally, uh, how to make uh, city maps and how to do six degrees of freedom localization uh, within those city maps. So if you're new to point clouds, here are some samples. You know, point clouds are captured with uh, laser scanners or time of flight scanners or structured light scanners. The ones that work outdoor and in long distances are LIDAR scanners. They give you the X, Y, Z coordinates of a point rather than the uh, reflected values from that point. And you need to have an additional uh, sort of sensors to give you a, a, the RGB values as well. And the LIDAR is going to give you the infrared reflectance intensity from that point as well, because the laser is infrared. And over here, these colors basically represent the segmentation that we did for this point cloud. So one color, uh, would stand for one uh, object. For example, the blue one is very obvious. That's the bus uh, in this one of the scans. So I'll start with uh, convolution on point clouds. <clears throat> As you know, uh, convolutions, CNNs got really popular because of their uh, hierarchical representation power and because of the parameters that they could reduce, you know, uh, compared to MLPs. So we thought, you know, I mean, we need to have some convolutions for point clouds. And because point clouds are not uh, on a rectangular grid, everything going. So, uh, so we thought we should have convolutions for point clouds as well, but point clouds are not rectangularly structured as images. So we can't have this three by three or five by five convolution kernels. So we said, okay, naturally we should have rather than a cubic kernel, which fits more like uh, volumetric data, we should have a spherical kernel, you know, where more importance is given to points that are close to the point where you're doing a convolution and less importance is given to the far, far off point. So bigger bins far off uh, and smaller bins close by. And you, where you can also have more control over the binning process. And of course there is self convolution as well. And the remaining process is exactly the same. You have uh, weights at every bin, just as you would have weights <coughs> at the bins of this, uh, uh, say a 2D rectangular uh, kernel or a 3D rectangular kernel, you have weights in every one of these spherical bins that are learned. So once you learn these weights, then you can, uh, you know, you can do convolutions over point clouds. And, and uh, what about downsampling? You know, one of the operations that was done on the rectangular grids in images was uh, pooling, and that would be done in a two by two grid. So here we need to do uh, pooling on point clouds. And for that, we construct uh, graphs from the point clouds, and then we downsample the graph using further uh, point sampling. There, I'll come later on to more sophisticated methods of downsampling of a graph, but the simplest one is just furthest point sampling. So you downsample the graph and then you kind of repeat the original bigger graph to go up. For example, if you're doing semantic segmentation, so you downsample, then you upsample. If you're doing classification, you don't need to upsample, you just get the features at the lower level, uh, the, the sort of the, uh, the lowest graph level, and then you uh, apply a classifier uh, for example, of fully connected layers and then classify. Uh, and then you back up again, of course, to learn the weights of the convolution kernel that, uh, that have been performed or, uh, along the way. Right, so rather than having too many MLPs along the way, we have convolution kernel, the kernel is spherical. And then to validate our kernel, we use these data set model N40, which is synthetic objects, full 3D objects for classification. There is the uh, part net or shape net. Uh, that is for part segmentation. Then there are real data sets, Umonge, which is a LiDAR scan of facade uh, of the European street. And then there is ScanNet, which is reconstructed point clouds of indoor scenes of uh, sort of 
home setting, bedrooms, dining rooms, uh, bathrooms, and so on. And then there, there is office spaces, S3DIS, that is also reconstructed. So you have like all 360 degree views in these point clouds. So they are not raw prop point clouds. Here are results. So at that time, you know, this was published in 2020 in PAMI. So we had uh, sort of uh, the state of the art results on ModelNet. Uh, ShapeNet as well, and also we had a big jump on Rumonge uh, semantic segmentation. Well, I, I mean, in my point of view, you know, the most boring slides in a presentation are these tables, you know, so I'm going to go over them quickly because every table that any presenter is going to present is just going to say that, well, my method is at the top and otherwise that table wouldn't be there, you know, so you already know the, you know, the outcome of the story. But what you want to see over here is that the, the improvements are kind of, uh, you know, uh, in, in many cases, really small. So from one uh, method to the other method, the improvement is small and that's the margin. But if you look at you know, the jump from when first research started on that to the US method, the jump is big. So it is, research is progressing, but with, with, with the passage of time, these data sets are becoming saturated. And I wanna emphasize on this part segmentation, I'm gonna, not gonna present the, show the uh, table for the part segmentation part, I'm gonna show, that there are some errors in the ground truth. So these are high quality segmentations that we got. Uh, these are the low quality ones, but not because there was something wrong with our method, but because the, the ground truth was wrong. You know, here the Excel has not been uh, marked as a separate part, whereas our method found that the Excel is actually a separate part. The chair does not have separate feet. Uh, uh, feet where our method said, well, it does have separate Feet. So you want to make note of that. Don't trust on ground truth provided with big data sets. There is always some errors. So find out whether your method <coughs> actually uh, uh, is showing bad results on the incorrect ground truth or, the, uh, uh, or is, is there anything particularly wrong with the method itself. Right. So is spherical kernel really better than the uh, cubic kernel? Well, in terms of performance, it is. It is uh, an experiment that we did. So this is uh, kind of the nearest uh, uh, cubic kernel that we have to our kernel. And we have higher performance as well as uh, uh, less number of bins. So if you multiply four by four by four and uh, these values, you know, I mean, this kind of always hides some, so eight by two by two plus one, one is plus one is for self-convolution, less number of bins, less number of parameters, lighter, uh, faster training time and inference time, yet higher accuracy. So that's the advantage of spherical kernel. Right, <clears throat> so the spherical kernel is still a hard kernel. The sampling in real point clouds is always kind of uh, not non-uniform. Uh, and by points, so here I have an example of a, of a uh, spherical, uh, sort of a circular kernel rather than spherical for ease of understanding. So if you have points very close to the boundary, you know, they might well fall in this bin or in the other bin, you know, in one scan from, from one scan to the other scan. And that can cause a lot of problems, you know, you will get errors. So in that case, we can have a fuzzy kernel where, uh, where the points are uh, convolved continuously and based on their distance from the center point where we are going to convolve the value and uh, <coughs> accumulate. Right, so we came up with this fuzzy bin. Here we have, uh, rather than four by two plus one, we have a four by one. So we have fuzziness only in the radial dimension here. And next was to, uh, we, we, <coughs> Uh, we also upgraded our uh, convolutional network. We had ResNet-like encoder layers. And the more important part over here is that we had very simple upsampling the, uh, the uh, decoder layers were very simple. And this simplicity not only made the uh, graph architecture lightweight, but also improved accuracy surprisingly. And I wanted to test this whether it will also hold good for uh, images or not, you know, generally you have seen unit type architectures, they have exactly the same layers at the encoder as the decoder, you know, they just sort of replicate it. You don't need to do that. Upscaling can be done very quickly. In, in point clouds, you'll get better accuracy and uh, uh, faster inference time and lightweight network as well. <clears throat> so is spherical kernel better than the uh, uh, is the fuzzy version of the spherical kernel better than the uh, discrete uh, spherical kernel? Well, it is. And to put that to test, we start decreasing the number of points 
uh, in the data set. As I said, S3DIS and ScanNet, they're both reconstructed point clouds. Just so the sampling is really good. You know, it's not like a single scan where the sampling would start depleting or becoming really sparse when you're as you go far from the sensor. So we synthetically remove points from uh, uh, from those sample uh, from the samples at test time and see that the hard spherical kernel you know, sort of the accuracy drops very quickly compared to the fuzzy spherical kernel with, where the accuracy drops slowly. So yeah, it does help. And it helps more if you have uh, wide changes or more changes in the, uh, in the sampling rate of the point cloud. Right, so this move, moving on. So we had the spherical kernel, the fuzzy variant, all these graph convolutions, we want, we, we put them uh, into a library and we named it Picasso. Why Picasso? That, I mean, to me, the drawings of the Picasso kind of look like triangular meshes. So we, that was published first in uh, CVPR 2021. Now we have an extended version that, ha, that is under review, but the library itself is available and also the <clears throat> under review, uh, yeah paper is available on archive. So this is the structure of the library. Most importantly, it has mesh convolutions. Now, all these other libraries, they, they process points only. We, we have specific kernels that I'll talk about in, in, in subsequent flight, slide. We have convolutions that are specifically designed for meshes. And also we have, uh, we say that it's the first CUDA-based mesh simplification algorithm. Reviewers said that there are some others available, but <clears throat> Uh, they were not suitable for our uh, use. So there's a famous mesh simplification algorithm called uh, based on quadric error, QEM. <clears throat> and uh, we used that and extended that to be applicable in, uh, in a parallel environment. So to do that, we no longer contract the uh, uh, edges sequentially, we do them in parallel. And to do that in parallel, we do some clustering and we cluster these uh, uh, the vertices or the nodes based on their quadric error. So the first cluster will form between C and D because their quadric error is the smallest. So we connect C to D. Now, because C and D has, are connected, they cannot be part of any other cluster. Then the next one that we can form is uh, E and F because they have the uh, next smaller uh, quadric error and then uh, A and G. And now after this, now we can no longer perform <coughs> more clustering on this toy example. So we, the one uh, uh, node that is left, we connect it to this cluster because the quadric array is smaller from there. Now we can contract these uh, vertices individually and uh, in parallel. So we get this mesh where this one is the average of A, G, D, and so on. And our implementation of this mesh simplification uh, works uh, on batches. So if you have a batch of like say 30 meshes, it will uh, uh, decimate them <clears throat> or simplify them in parallel. And each individual one, it will also break it down into this uh, these cluster and do the contraction based on the clusters individually. So it runs much faster than the original QEM. For example, this input mesh was simplified to this by QEM in uh, over 2000 milliseconds. Our one took only 65 milliseconds to give even a uh, bigger simplification. Uh, we couldn't match the number because here the number of uh, faces are controlled and here number of vertices are controlled. In fact, for deep learning, it is better to control the number of uh, vertices. And this is just a simple uh, implementation of vertex clustering that still does not run as fast as our algorithm. Right, so talking about the convolutions that are specifically designed for meshes. So we have a facet to vertex convolution where features from all these facets are convolved to get features at the center vertex. And these features starting initially could well be the texture on these vertices, on these facets. So you can convolve the texture features to get a feature over here. We have vertex, we have vertex to facet convolution. So in the next round, you can convolve these vertices to get another feature at the faces. So you can keep going all these combinations of facet to vertex, vertex to facet, facet to vertex, or you could also have a, a facet to facet convolution where all the facets around this facet are going to get convolved to get, give you a feature, feature at the center facet. <clears throat> or you could have a point convolution uh, by uh, starting with a vertex to facet convolution and then doing a facet to vertex convolution or just do, or simply applying the spherical convolution that works on uh, vertices. All right, so with this, you can make uh, deep models that would actually operate on 
on meshes rather than points. What is the advantage? Well, I show you a point cloud and ask you, what is this? And then I show you the same point cloud where the vertices are connected. Which one would be easier to classify? Of course, the one that is connected with vertices, you know, where the vertices are connected. And this is, this is how you see the models in your games. <clears throat> All those vertices are connected and the texture is mapped on top of them. So that makes it easy for us to recognize. And of course, it becomes easy for the deep model to recognize. For more complicated problems, it will be easier for the deep model to recognize meshes rather than uh, only vertices. So here I have a toy example of a uh, deep model that you can design given our uh, CUDA, <coughs> this, sorry, uh, Picasso library. So this one is untextured message. So we start with uh, face it to vertex convolution, and then you proceed with uh, mass decimation. So you can do this mass decimation on the fly. You don't need to decimate these meshes and keep them in memory <coughs> because the decimation or the simplification is fast. The graphs that I showed previously, those need to, needed to be stored in memory for fast learning. If you have textured meshes, then you simply replace this module with this, where you have uh, the facet to facet convolution as well, uh, running in parallel with the vertex to vertex convolution. So in, in fact, you can have any combination of these convolutions, any skip connection, anything that is already present in the current libraries because the Picasso library integrates with PyTorch, and uh, TensorFlow. <clears throat> so uh, I, I'm not showing the uh, architecture over here, but we had a more sophisticated deeper network in the mesh processing architecture. And we applied it on, on these different uh, mesh data sets, which is ShapeNet Core, Shrek, Cube, Coseg, Human, and Faust. And, uh, uh, and this is, uh, with these data sets, the problem is classification. This is semantic labeling of parts. And Faust is for correspondence between uh, different shapes. And you can see that uh, we have the highest accuracy on all these. And not all these methods have been tested on all the data sets. And we have tested on all these data sets. We have beating them all across the board. So the real power of Picasso library is if you want to process meshes. With other, uh, it is as powerful as uh, existing methods. <laughs> Right, so coming to LiDAR data, so uh, that was just uh, some old work that I presented. Uh, our main interest in our lab is now with processing uh, LiDAR data. And for that, because of the saturation in the uh, online data sets, and especially when we started this work, <coughs> I think three years ago, the, there was not as many data sets available. The labeling was not good. So we captured our own data. So we stuck uh, a LiDAR uh, on top of uh, basically my car and we drove around Perth and we constructed this data set uh, where we have uh, a lot of data that is unlabeled for self-supervised learning. And we have labeled, labeled data set, which is registered scans and raw scans as well. And for labeling, we also developed our own labeling tool because this is not a 2D image that you could pop up and you know scribble on top and label it. This is 3D, you need to rotate, you need to have these shapes, cylinder shapes, sphere shapes, cubic shapes, and you know maybe hand-drawn labeling to give labels to these points. So it, I think we have 25 semantic labels over here. So we can do labeling on this tool and we can register, for example, say 50 different scans and label them at once. So any object that is labeled once and then you unregister them, you know, get them apart, you know, you'll have the 50 scans labeled at once. And this also saves them in a format that can be picked up directly by PyTorch. And we'll divide these scans because uh, none of these deep models, uh, or most of them don't process the full 360 degree scans. So you can choose your uh, size of the cubes. So it will divide them into cubes or uh, slices, you know, if you're doing cylindrical uh, division and we'll save them with the labels. So this is some statistics of our data set. It just says that, you know, Perth has a lot of trees and then uh, buildings and so on. We, uh, some of the semantic labels are shown over here and you can see the wide changes in the number of points that can go on a certain object. You know, you have more points on the road, for example, over here, uh, there is road, yeah. And you get less points on say, um, uh, fewer points on, on uh, light poles because they're very thin and so on. So this disparity in the data set is always there. Some objects appear more, some appear less. 
We do data augmentation to cover, uh, make up for that. For example, we just throw in some extra light poles because you can do that really easily in, in, uh, in point clouds. <clears throat> and uh, augmented data appears as good as real data. If you augment images like this, any human would be able to tell, oh, I think you have done some Photoshop over here. You know, you've cropped an image and stuck it over here. But if I do this in point cloud and I show it to you, you'd not be able to tell. So PC Urban was our first data set that is already released. Our next data set is a SWAN data set that's even bigger. Uh, and compare, comparing that to Semantic Kitty, you know, we have 24 labels instead of 19 and new scenes that's only 16. Uh, and our, uh, some other statistics as well. Our scanner is not as expensive. We have the Ouster 64 channel uh, LiDAR, which is only $10,000. Velodyne is $60,000. Uh, so you, you do the comparison over here, <clears throat> right? So, and everybody started to move to transformers. So we said, okay, let's do semantic segmentation with transformers, but transformers are really heavy. They need a lot of data for training. That much data is still not available, even with our, our data set and all the data set that are uh, uh, online, we were not able to train a heavyweight transformer. So we went uh, for slot attention transformer. So slot attention is basically, uh, this uh, a very lightweight uh, layer that has been, uh, I think it was <coughs> uh, proposed in uh, uh, NeurIPS 2020 for object discovery on 2D images. So we took that slot attention layer, it, it operates in, where is my, uh, it operates in uh, uh, sequentially. So you get, you get multiple iterations of slot attention. Uh, and then you can follow it up with a single decoder and the decoder over here, uh, because we have point clouds, we designed this decoder specifically for the problem at hand. And it is, uh, is quite different from the decoder that was uh, proposed with the original slot attention paper. The encoder uh, almost, uh, you know, is, is, is very sim uh, similar to the uh, encoder of the original slot attention paper. But before that, we also do some uh, cylindrical partitioning or, of the data and we apply uh, uh, spatial sparse uh, 3D convolution to get uh, the embeddings. And we also include the positional embeddings with them. And then we pass them through a series of encoder decoder layers where the encoder is slot attention and the slot attention operates in <coughs> iterations. So every time, uh, the slots are refined and these number of slots, they, you select them initially at random and then they are refined with, uh, with, with this attention mechanism and uh, followed by uh, the gated recurrent unit uh, and eventually an MLP uh, as well. And the more iterations you give, the better, more it refines until it saturates. So we had, I think, uh, eight iterations over here. Uh, and the more iterations you apply, the more computations you need. And it is linear in the number of the slots and the number of uh, in, uh, input uh, embeddings and uh, the number of iterations that you apply. Right. So with this slot uh, attention transformer, we were able to achieve state-of-the-art results. But for a fair comparison, you know, we took the, uh, the models that were available and we trained them on, on the Kitty data set ourselves, and then we submitted the results to the server. So these results are from the server. And uh, we also did the same with uh, new scenes. Uh, so we trained these models ourselves and we reapplied re them because we discovered that when you download their pre-trained model, you know, that works really well. But if you retrain their pre-trained model, <clears throat> if you retrain their model from uh, scratch using exactly the same parameters that they have provided, it does not perform that well. And this is kind of, this paper is under review and the reviewers kind of appreciated this, yeah, that this is uh, the case out there. And they also appreciated the difficulty of training transformers on, uh, on outdoor scenes. I'll come to that comparisons as well. So this is, these are the results on our own data set. And you see that the margin kind of increases on our own data set. It sort of says that, you know, results are getting saturated on, um, uh, on, the, uh, on the public data sets that are available. So it's kind of implicit saturation that data set is available. The whole world is working on those public data sets. They keep refining, keep changing their algorithm, keep changing their algorithm until it starts uh, until it gives good results on uh, on that data set. Right, so it's always good to have your own data set 
uh, not only to understand uh, what the problem really is and how to process the data from scratch, but also that how do the, on the methods that are published, uh, you know, they perform on your data set. Right, so we have a bigger margin over here. Uh, so if you remember Cylinder 3D was a closed performer, but over here we have uh, almost 3.5% uh, or something improvement or uh, from that method. <laughs> okay, so I, I mentioned that uh, data augmentation is really easy in point clouds. Um, so that uh, exploiting on that, we uh, proposed self-supervised learning for multiple object tracking in 3D point clouds. So I'm moving on to the next topic here. So we came up with very simple uh, data augmentation techniques. One was to take uh, CAD models, you know, synthetic CAD models from ModelNet 40, make frame one from them, then move them and make frame two from them. So now we know where the objects are where they have moved. So we have the detection information, we have the tracking information. And to push this further, you also took some trivial uh, basic geometric shapes and then we made frame one out of them and then we made frame two out of them. And we applied translation, rotation and cutout. Cutout was to mimic uh, occlusions. We did not put any background. We did not do any fancy reconstruction of uh, LIDAR scenes over here. And we trained a network. Uh, we trained it so that we would get uh, an affinity matrix. So uh, not the whole uh, tracking results because we then process the affinity matrix with linear programming to get the tracks uh, finally. So, so we crop out the detected objects. So this kind of assumes that the objects are pre-detected. So it's a detection a tracking by detection where the detector is external. So these are uh, detected objects or they uh, then we cut them out, we put them as X, Y, Z, and then the number of points in the other dimension and the number of objects in the, uh, uh, in the third dimensions so we make cubes out of them, they perform 1D convolutions on these cubes and apply a max pooling uh, to get the features of these objects. And then we also extract simple features, which we call the box features, which is the location of the corners of the box and then we concatenate these features with the, uh, with the object appearance feature, the 3D appearance features. And we only use point clouds in all these works that I'm presenting. We don't use the RGB color for, uh, uh, for theoretical reasons. We want to see how much we can push the points, you know, uh, you know how do they compare to RGB based you know, tracking and detection and so on. So this gives us, uh, we order them uh, in a cube where NM is the maximum number of objects that we aim to detect, NM by NM and 1152 is the features uh, of uh, one frame, of objects of one frame, right? And then we apply a series of uh, uh, 3D convolutions to reduce the dimension of this N by N uh, by 1152 so that at the end it, we get a 2D uh, affinity matrix, right? Which will be N, NM by NM. We concatenate a, a, a row and a column to that to mimic appearing of new objects and disappear of, of existing objects. So if an object from frame one does not match any object from uh, frame two, then you gotta have a column so that it has a higher match to that column, which means this object disappeared. And if a new object appears in frame two, you gotta have another row to this affinity matrix. And then we apply two, uh, we, we apply soft max row wise and column wise to, to, to this matrix. And then we compare it with the ground truth to calculate two losses. Uh, one is a loss with only the, uh, the column uh, uh, affinity matrix and one is the loss with the row affinity matrix. And we add these two losses to uh, train this network back to back. Now this network, sometimes we train it only with the synthetic data, self-supervised, and sometimes we train it with the real data. And in, in the synthetic data case, sometimes we train it with the CAD models and sometimes we train it with uh, the primitive shapes. So this was uh, applied to the Jackrabbit uh, benchmark, which where you submit your results to a server. Our method uh, was on the, uh, is still on the top on the 2019 benchmark. You know, they've released recently a new one, uh, but our method remains uh, at the top of the old be benchmark with 22.96 MOTA. And uh, here I have the same table, uh, table replicated, but 
uh, results given for different combinations. So this 22.96 is using CAD objects. So this is self-supervised trained using only CAD objects. Performs better than the real data training with real frames, which is uh, 19 point, uh, eight zero. So that's in the self-supervised way. And it's even better than uh, with the real frames, you just cut an object, put it somewhere else to mimic movement, right? Was in, in, in the supervised way, uh, it, it got 22.20, which is still less than this. I mean, why? Uh, because maybe we can generate more synthetic data than there is real label data, right? And even the uh, primitive shapes, that still gives decent accuracy, right? So here I have a short video of tracking. We'll also appreciate why track in 3D and what, why not just in 2D? 2D is good enough. Well, you can't. If you're doing self-driving or navigation, in this case, there's a small robot, you know, you want to overtake, you want to find out how much, if there is a space in front of this person or this, in front of this car or not. 3D tracking gives you exact 3D location of something, its size as well. So it's a precise, more precise localization that even, and so are the tracks. So it's always better to have tracking information in 3D. Right. So the next work that we did, Maybe I'm going too fast, you know. <laughs> okay, so I'm always uh, scared of uh, going over time, you know. You know, have you have this uh, phobias? I have a phobia of going over time in my presentations. <laughs> yeah, and I'm leaving no time for questions, you know. <laughs> okay, so uh, so that was on. Uh, uh, yeah, this way maybe I'll leave more time for questions. I'm going too fast. So the next one that we did was okay. Let's combine the detection and tracking into one framework. You know, why why rely on an external uh, detector? Uh, let's let's design a network that can be both. And the inspiration was also from our prior ECCV paper, uh, uh, which was a 2020 paper, simultaneous detection and tracking of objects, which was in 2D. But that approach was quite different from this one. Uh, this paper is uh, also in review. So here we take three LIDAR frames as input. So that's another interesting aspect. And uh, you will appreciate, I mean, the more uh, frames that you take, of course, your processing gets heavy, but you have more temporal context. So we, for, for every frame, we use the same uh, transformer network to get uh, feature tokens. We organize the feature tokens into an affinity matrix by taking their uh, uh, dot product. And then we have uh, self-attention and cross-attention over these affinity matrix. We can do cross-attention because we have two affinity matrices, and that, that, that is one advantage of processing three frames, because we can get two affinity matrices between frame one and two, two and three, and then we can do cross-attention. So the self, uh, this is self-attention is basically a transformer, so we applied transformer-like self-attention on affinity matrices, and we claim that as our major contribution, and then we apply a transformer-like uh, attention or uh, cross attention on the affinity matrices. So it's the same uh, um, QD key value kind of uh, technique. Uh, 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 and in the um, uh, cross attention case, the QD comes from the, the other affinity matrix, right? And this is followed by network heads that would estimate the bounding boxes and see the original token features are also going to this uh, network head, which is estimating the center point and the bounding box of the object. So that is doing uh, the detection. And the tracking is being done by this network head, which takes the refined affinity matrix to estimate the track offsets. And the detections from this frame also go into the uh, detection head of the next one, which kind of takes the previous information and also the current information to do a detection in this current frame. So it's sort of the information rolls over as you do tracking. And more interestingly, we supervise the affinity matrix. So this is not self-supervised. This is simultaneous detection and tracking, which is fully supervised. So we have uh, supervision of the affinity matrix. So we have a loss over here, and then we have uh, the bounding box in the center location uh, loss uh, at the detection part. We don't have a loss at the tracking offset <clears throat> that is computed from the <laughs> detection. So for frame, you have a detection in frame one, you have a detection in frame two, and then the offset kind of gives you the tracking offset. And then we uh, use these offsets to connect objects from multiple frames. 
So here are some ablation studies that shows uh, on the jackrabbit data set that, you know, to the baseline, when you have self-attention and affinity, it significantly improves the tracking accuracy and reduces the number of ID switches. IDS is ID switches. And then if you add cross attention, uh, the uh, accuracy further improves and uh, you have uh, even less number of uh, ID switches. So compare, comparing that to previous work, you know, PC Dan was even an earlier version of what I showed, you know, the uh, 3D SS uh, um, uh, that we uh, have in IROS. So PC Dan was, uh, uh, we published it in, uh, in a workshop in uh, CVP, uh, uh, not this CVPR, I think it was a previous one. Uh, yeah. So, but the advantage over here is that we have fewer ID switches. If you look at that, we have the least number of ID switches. We have more uh, higher precision, uh, and we have all, almost compar uh, comparable uh, accuracy, uh, multiple object tracking accuracy. And the advantage is with that we neither require external detector and we neither require complex post-processing uh, stages. LNI means LiDAR and image data. So this one method takes LiDAR and image data, data both. Here I have results on the uh, Waymo and Kitty uh, validation sets. Uh, on both these data sets, we have the highest accuracy. And there are some other methods which also uh, don't have an external detector. So they don't take an external detector, neither have post complex pro post processing steps, but our method is uh, still at the top. And this is for Kitty cars because Kitty have um, pedestrians as well. Okay, so moving on. Uh, sorry, I had a few demos over here. Uh, just one. It's impossible to find the mouse on the screen. Okay, so these are these are some demos on the uh, Kitty data set. So you can see that uh, on, on the right side that we can actually, so I'm showing RGB over here only for illustration. This detection and tracking was done purely on point clouds. RGB data was not even used, but you know, if I showed uh, uh, tracking on a point cloud, they look quite uh, cluttered. You can't make out anything. You already saw the Jackrabbit data set. Even that was hard to perceive. It's even more difficult in the case of cars. So over here, if you look at this without attention, you know, this, these IDs are, these colors are changing, which means the IDs of these cars are switching. Whereas when you have uh, attention on the affinities, you, the car color does not change, does not change. See, over here, the car color changes. That's because we don't have attention over the affinity. Okay, so moving on to uh, 3D, 3D mapping and uh, localization. So what, uh, here we also have a uh, cell supervision uh, to train the transformer because we use a uh, sort of a heavyweight transformer over here and to really get uh, the uh, full power of transformer, we need to pre-train that transformer on, and for pre-training, we need a uh, pretext task for self supervision. Okay, so let me show you some uh, videos of the what is the mouse? Want to show you this video? Yeah, uh, I can't see where. We're getting closer to the main machine help. <laughs> okay, that's why we're far from the.
Okay, so if, if you ever been to Perth, you'll recognize these streets. So this is, we're doing data collection driving in the Perth city. That's William Street. Turning on to St. George's Terrace. Shooting might get some memories back, you know, of uh, Perth CBD, <laughs> she's been there recently. Barrack Street. So one of the things that you can see is that, you know, by looking at the video, I mean, we can detect all these cars. We can even find out where the pedestrians are, where the light poles are. That's so, so the information is there. It kind of gives us hope that we'll be able to uh, extract the same deep learning. And so this is, we are registering the frames now, going to St. George's Terrace. And, and so we drive around, we collect frames, then we register them. Uh, 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 using a variant of ICP. And we try to collect data in loops so that the error does not accumulate. You know, and the starting point and the end, end point kind of are matched and the error is distributed. So by doing so, we, we have constructed a map of the major part of uh, Perth CBD. And this, this is basically a combination of 19 sub maps. And I'll show you uh, a side-by-side -side comparison with, uh, with uh, Google Maps. So that's, that's Google Maps. So. And this is a flyover uh, to the constructed map of Perth City. Have we ever done segmentation on this? We only know the roads though, but I didn't color them uh, separately. Okay, so now that we have the map, uh, we, uh, we need to first pre-trained the transformer for pre-training, we have come up with this pretext task where we divide the point cloud into four quadrants and then we shuffle them. And uh, for each shuffling, we give them a separate label. So we get 24 labels from this shuffled point cloud. Let's Mouse glitch again. <clears throat> okay, so we get 24 different labels from the shuffle point cloud and we train the uh, 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 transformer to classify each one of these uh, shuffled point clouds, right? So four quadrants, there are 24 combinations. So you've got 24 labels and then you don't need to label any training data. Every frame gives you uh, 24 possibilities. So that's uh, if you, you've you collected 30 frames per second, multiply that by uh, 24 and imagine how much training data you could collect in one hour only. So that's a lot of data. So it's all up to your computation power, how much you can uh, you know sort of process. So we have, uh, you can see we have uh, multi-head attention over here and we passed the, uh, uh, the First, we do a slicing of the 360 degrees. We, we, uh, we have 36 slices. Each slice is 30 degrees wide, and we have a 20 degree overlap between the slices. So every time we move 10 degrees, keeping 10, uh, 20 degrees overlap with the previous slice. Uh, we also in, encode the uh, input embeddings, the locations, uh, and then we pass them through uh, eight slice transformers. We, we call it a slice transformer because it is operating on slices. Uh, the uh, architecture of individual uh, slice transformer is shown in detail over here. And once this is trained, we put a simple classification layer at the end to see if our, um, you know, this uh, pretext task training worked well or not. So we use model net 40 and scan NN for object classification. And we see from the results that, well, the, uh, uh, the backbone was trained really well. It's performing, uh, giving really good results on uh, model net 40 classification as well as scan NN. In fact, uh, we have the highest accuracy on both. And this is because we pre-trained uh, our network on lots of lots of data for those 24 classes and then finally fine-tuned it on these individual data sets. Right, so once we have the... Uh, backbone trained, we stick it into this network. So that's the self-supervised backbone in, in, in green color over here. Then we follow it up with a further uh, feature filtering, which is just a bunch of linear layers and uh, uh, follow up by uh, max pooling and then 
two regression layers to estimate the uh, translation vector and the rotation uh, angles. So we have three rotation angles over here, uh, yaw, pitch, roll, and we have uh, three X, Y, Z translation values uh, over here to estimate. And for this, of course, we use supervised data, which wasn't that difficult to generate and the supervision for that, the labels, because why? Because once you register the data, you already have those registration values. And, and based on where you put your origin, you know exactly where every frame's X, Y, Z translation value is and where every frame's uh, yaw pitch and roll value is. So the second part is also, you could say, I mean, even though this is supervised, the labels are kind of automatically obtained. Right, so here we have results on our Perth uh, data set, and we could find another uh, one uh, online data set, which is the Apollo South Bay data set. On the, on the Apollo South Bay data set, uh, two uh, very old techniques were tried out. They were both from the robotics community, IROS and ICRA. And we see that we beat uh, both those on the Apollo South Bay data set. And we could only find one public implementation of uh, this uh, <coughs> localization work, which is point lock. And we compare to that method uh, on our data set. So we also beat that method by a big margin. We, and the baseline is basically our network without the cell supervised pre training. So the transformer is not cell supervised pre training. You can see that there's a significant improvement uh, that happens because of the self supervised training. Right. And the other thing that we can notice that is that our data set is more challenging because the errors on our data set are much higher than the Apollo South Bay uh, data set. Right. So uh, <clears throat> here, I think the title is transformers versus convolutions or something because I can't read it. <laughs> okay. On 3D bench pass convolution networks are top performers checking papers with code. If you haven't seen this website, it's called papers with code. It gives very good um, you know, overview of uh, the benchmarks in any, on any problems. They, they divide the, uh, the uh, for every problem, they list all the benchmarks and on every benchmark, they list the papers in order of accuracy. So the top three performance, performers on semantic segmentation problem on the scanner data set is Mix3D, which is, CNN, which is convolution based. OCNN has CNN in its name, so that's convolution based. DPNet is also convolution based. On this 3D semantic kitty problem, the top three performers are again convolution based. The second is number two, this AF2S3Net is also number one on new scenes, which is another data set for semantic segmentation. So in short, you know, I mean, as far as benchmarks are concerned, uh, top performers are convolution networks. And the main power seems to come from how the data is handled. For example, the mixed 3D does not present a new convolution network. It presents a new method of data augmentation. It says that if you mix out of context objects, you know, that the network is going to learn better. And uh, <clears throat> similarly, uh, the BPNet kind of uh, presents a new projection network, you know, that's, uh, and, uh, and knowledge distillation techniques to, to better train existing networks. The, the same goes for Cylinder 3D, is, is how the data is organized. So network uh, pre-training, supervision, and knowledge distillation combined with data pre-processing and augmentation, they seem to give a lot of power to, uh, uh, to point cloud analysis techniques. Right, and and this is because uh, you know point cloud data is not as uh, as clean as image data. It's, it's, it's unstructured, uh, it's non-uniform. The, uh, the there's occlusion problems. There is uh, sampling variations and so on. So transformers seem to be limited by the need for more training data, uh, more memory, and uh, more computational resources. So if you see a transformer. Uh, architecture, you know, really performing well, you know, it's, it's usually from the big groups who can afford these luxuries. You know, I'm not saying that uh, convolutions are better than transformers. I think transformers have a lot of potential, but to really put, get that potential, you need more training data, you need more uh, memory, you need more computational resources. This brings me to the end of my talk. <laughs> so, presented a fuzzy spherical kernel, which seems to be a natural choice. So if you make it fuzzy in all dimensions, you know, we basically got some sort of uh, weighted convolution based on the distances of points from the center point. Um, 
which seems to be uh, the idea behind many existing convolutions. And you also saw that simple convolutions at a decoder stage offer much higher accuracy and of course, lower number of parameters. Uh, this Picasso library, uh, you, I invite you to explore Picasso library, design your own networks, especially for problems that require 3D meshes rather than just point clouds. Uh, a lot of uh, potential there for graphics research. So a labeling tool is available online as well. You can use that for labeling your own data and for bulk labeling. Uh, and self, simple self-supervision techniques work really well for, uh, did, did, the, did the online thing still again change for the screen? Oh, you're getting the screen. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> okay, so city maps. So one thing that you may not have noticed is that uh, once I train a neural network with the city map, I don't need the city map anymore that kind of is encoded inside the network itself. So all you need to do is to get a new frame, feed it forward through the uh, network that is trained and out comes the location of your, your car and the orientation. So transformer architectures are promising, but their full potential is yet to be proven for point cloud analysis. So that brings me to the end. So yeah, that didn't go over time, so. We'll have, uh, I think, eight, eight minutes. Oh, yeah, we have enough. <laughs> yeah, thank you, uh, Professor Mai. Yeah, it's uh, uh, such a uh, very rich, very uh, uh, complicated talk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, especially the diagrams. I know that nowadays all the deep learning, uh, you know, uh, you know, have a uh, there's a, um, you know structure, many layers, and uh, processing. Yeah. Um, Maybe we have a question from the floor first, and then we can check online, uh, you know, chat box. Yeah. Um, thank you, Professor Mian, for the amazing talk. Um, I actually have two questions. So the first one is that uh, I realized that uh, most of the architectures, for example, the point net, uh, they are look what they learn is the outline of the input shape. So. What if I uh, what I um if I have a different application, what I care is not the outline of the input, uh, but the small local features of the input. Then, uh, what do you suggest? Uh, which type of architecture is more suitable for this kind of applications? So the the best way to go is to have a combination of uh, local convolutions combined with uh, transformers. So for transformers, we look at long uh, long term dependencies, and the local convolution will get the kind of features that you're looking for. Point net does not get the local features because uh, it does not have those local convolutions. You know, so if you go for let's say uh, either a spherical convolution or a, a, even KP conf, yeah. or or any kind of uh, uh, graph construction that connects local points uh, into a, a graph structure yeah. and then convolves. So that give you, they, they give you the local structure. Then, yeah, then my second question is related to the convolution of a based uh, neural network. That is, uh, I realized as the uh, input resolution increases, uh, the complexity increases like cubically. So with a convolution, which means it's intensive computation. And uh, if I have a uh, if I have an application, the input resolution is very high, and uh, what I want is to learn the local feature. Then, do you think convolution is the best choice for it? Uh, okay, so the, your complexity increases cubically if you use um, voxel-based representation. Okay. Yeah. Uh, to avoid that, there is there is sparse three D convolution. So there's, that's one approach. And the other one, uh, if you recall, uh, I talked about the fuzzy convolutions combined with that ResNet-like uh, encoder and a simple decoder. Uh, that architecture on, uh, I, I think it was a Titan uh, XP, could process a million points per second. Uh, okay. Right. So, and, and and that's using fuzzy convolution, which is heavier than the discrete convolution. So, if you replace it with discrete convolution, which is not as bad, if your data is okay, you know, so that will run even faster than that. So, your suggestion is to use fuzzy convolution. And uh, well, my suggestion is to use uh, sparse uh, like 
like oak tree. Uh, grafts. No, no, oak tree is heavy. Okay. That, that is where we started. Oak tree becomes heavy because every time the graph gets multiplied by eight. Okay. So yeah. after uh, four or five levels of oak tree, you have so many voxels that they go out of uh, hand. And they are sparse, but they're still too, too many. That's why we grow, moved on to GCNs. Nowadays, even GCNs are, uh, are not that um, uh, popular. Uh, these uh, transformer-based architectures are, but you know, still the lightweight transformers. I think the slot attention is a very good way to go because that's that's really uh, uh, lightweight. Yeah, and and you can do with the uh, complexity of the data or the size of the data at the input. Like I said, you know, pre-processing plays a heavy role uh, in in uh, point cloud analysis. So if you get a point cloud. You know, a single scan gives you, I don't know how many, over 4,000 or some points, if uh, maybe more than that. If you try to feed that all points just like that into a network, you know, that's that's ideal, yeah. but- That's know, a good point, yeah. Yeah, it may not be the most optimal way. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, clearly it's beyond my expertise, so I have some silly questions. Uh, it's amazing, like you use LADAR to scan the street and the buildings, right? So do you use it to scan something else? Well, we, we have papers on LADAR-based weed detection. <laughs> In, yeah, so that's with the, the agriculture department. So mm -hmm. the theory is simple that the weeds kind of grow higher than the crops. Mm -hmm. So they do a LADAR scan. So they do clustering. First they find, find points that are higher then the other points, and then do, do spatial clustering to find their spatial locations. Mm -hmm. And now they know exact X, Y, Z locations to target for weeding spray. So that's mm -hmm. one uh, other application. Uh, you can do LiDAR-based scanner for in, uh, inside the rooms. You, know? mm -hmm. uh, you could do it for, uh, let's say, change detection in buildings, infrastructure. So uh, these are all the uh, possibilities. You can also, uh, because it's uh, video, you know, it's like 25 or 30 scans per second. So maybe you can scan uh, some moving object and see uh, its real movement in X, Y, Z space. Mm -hmm. For example, I could scan an athlete running and do some analysis on that. Uh, just a full on questions. I'm curious, like if you scan on different city, for example, in Sydney or uh, Paris, in camera, for example, if they have different structure of the buildings, will you use the same algorithm? Yeah, the network would be the same. Training would need to be repeated. Ah. The backbone would still be the same because the backbone is trained uh, in an unsupervised way, but the ah. fine tuning, the later part of the, uh, you know, the smaller part of the training would be repeated, but the network architecture, the algorithm would be the same. Ah, interesting. And, and, yeah, and thanks, lady. one question, you know, that uh, the audience used to ask, you know, I mean, why not just Google Maps, you know, it tells you where you are, you know, so this is kind of localization where you look at the localization and turn right based on that. You wouldn't look at your Google Maps screen or say, okay, turn right, turn left. No, you can't do that. You know, mm -hmm. this localization is, this is all the self-driving car has. So I'm at the end of the road. This is where I turn right. So this is the precision that it should give. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I think we may leave, uh, we may give priority to the online, online people. A uh, few questions, I think Charlie can unmute them. I think people here will have a more opportunity to talk to Ajman later. Um, yeah, uh, Charlie, could you help to uh, let those people to um, um, talk? I think Hassan, you have some question, uh, Professor Abbas. Uh, okay. Uh, oh, thank you. Um, thank you for an outstanding uh, talk. Uh, the question is designing a single network that can do many things like segmentation, detection, tracking uh, is is obviously an an, an efficient way uh, of uh, putting all of these tasks together. Uh, but also it brings complexity in model maintenance and explainability. So what's your advice on the trade-off between how much we can 
package inside uh, a deep neural network uh, as opposed to uh, the, the the cost that gets paid in um, in in the actual uh, maintenance of these models over time and potentially the explainability of the model over time. Thank you. Okay, so that's an interesting question. <clears throat> So firstly, I, I did have uh, separate models for uh, all these tasks, but um, with potentially it's possible to have a single model or single backbone that is trained for feature extraction, and then uh, you apply it to all, all these tasks. And, and in my opinion, that kind of reduces your uh, model maintenance because you have a single backbone uh, rather than many other uh, you know, like different backbones for uh, for every different task to maintain, and explainability is is uh, is as difficult for in this case as it is in in a custom designed uh, network, unless it, it explainability is embedded into the design of the network. You know, so there are two paradigms of uh, AI explainability. One is uh, designing a network such that the design is explainable. And the other one is that those are called uh, pre-hoc or uh, pre-designed uh, pre explainable networks. And then there are post-hoc techniques, which is you design a network and after it has made a decision, you try to explain that. So I'm not sure if I answered your question, you know, I mean, there is no perfect answer to that. Uh, the, uh, in my opinion, having a single backbone for multiple tasks uh, reduces maintenance, but also, in my opinion, that having a single backbone for many different tasks is, is not easy to achieve because uh, the backbone will always be trained with some pretext task. And the closer that pretext task is to your actual task, the better your network will perform. Right? So there's a very good uh, uh, paper in, in, a, in, in a relatively old CVPR, I think 2018. Uh, it, it says uh, taskonomy. It was the best paper uh, in that CVPR 2018. Taskonomy. It's, it kind of says that how networks transfer from one task to the other gives you a taskonomy of that tasks. Thank you. Um, uh, I think next one, uh, Kang Jin. Uh, yeah, maybe you like to uh, talk. Yeah, um, there is a question. Um, it's from the beginning of the presentation, uh, we had the uh, spherical uh, kernels and the fuzzy spherical kernel as well. Uh, but I, I didn't fully understand the, uh, the spherical kernel calculation. Could you please uh, explain that? I, I could not get the question at all. You know, I mean, I, I think there's some problem with the audio, not that the no, question okay. was. Uh, uh, is my sound coming through? Maybe you can type the question. Okay. Uh, is my sound coming through right now? Yeah, 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 it's better. Okay. Um, I was just trying to ask uh, how does the spherical kernel calculates its uh, its results? So towards the beginning of the presentation, we've had the fuzzy kernel, or it's fuzzy spherical kernel. And then, um, yeah, I just want to see how the calculation takes place. So it's, it's just exactly the same as any other kernel would uh, perform. So you have kernel weights that are initialized randomly. And then you do a forward pass of a batch, calculate the error at the end, and then back propagate that error. And uh, you know, using the regularization technique and all this, you do a uh, kind of a gradient descent to optimize those uh, parameters based on that uh, one batch. And then you repeat that process for many other batches. So the learning process of the discrete kernel or the fuzzy kernel is the same as any other kernel that operates in, uh, in deep learning. Right, so uh, just to reiterate, it's same as the dense layer, is that correct? Uh, not the dense layers, uh, it's the same as a three by three kernel or a five by five kernel uh, in 2D images. Okay, so similar to convolution then? Yeah, it's similar to convolution. That's, okay. that's why we name it spherical convolution. Right, thank you. Okay, I think, uh, yeah, we are about time to finish, but there's a uh, uh, last question. Uh, Maybe um, just uh, um, you know uh, uh, go through this question, then we finish. Yeah. Now this one is from Yang Song. Yeah, regarding the errors in the ground truth, what would you recommend to be the best approach to address that? 
the errors in ground truth and should we consider revising the ground truth or some other ways like developing different evaluation matrices? Oh, well, the, uh, the errors in ground truth, uh, I highlighted them uh, so that you know, or whenever you calculate your results on a benchmark, you do look at your failure cases and then find out whether your failure case is really a failure case or is there an error in the ground truth, right? So I think that's, that's the best you can do. And then uh, you, uh, you could either go and correct those errors and submit the corrected ground truth to the data distributors. I had some data set distributed myself and people would send me uh, corrections of ground, ground truth, which would I would update on the website and they, uh, I would really appreciate their corrections. So they would also appreciate your corrections. And then as far as uh, the paper is concerned, you, you can report results by excluding these uh, erroneous uh, ground truth uh, part and reporting the results and also correcting the erroneous ground truth and reporting the results again. So there'll be three reports, you know, on exact benchmark results, uh, excluding the errors in ground truth results and, you know, correcting the errors in ground truth results. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, just uh, like I like to comment on that. Uh, sometimes uh, I got the, uh, some research work that they say they got hundred percent accuracy. I said, Ground truth is not 100% accurate. <laughs> yeah. yeah that's okay. For all big data sets, the ground truth is never 100% correct. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks again. Yeah. Thanks again. And uh, I think people physical can still have an opportunity to, uh, you know, have a chat with you yeah, yeah. during the lunch. Now, for online people, yeah, we move on. If you like to have more questions, you may email to me, uh, Supinja, or email to uh, Professor Mai directly. Yeah, so we move to the next speaker, uh, Dr. Ming um, Wang. Yeah. Dr. Ming Wang uh, is a, a professor, um, Jie Kun, who is a postdoc, and uh, she has been very active in research and also leadership in women, uh, women engineering. And she's, she's chairing a special group of the, the special interest in uh, AI. Um, for the uh, you know that's related to his uh, her work, uh, I mean her work. Yeah. 